The fundamental paradox of games design is that players simultaneously want rules that make the battles they are fighting as realistic and intuitive as possible, while at the same time wanting their Space Knight commander to be able to run the length of the board and plunge a chainsaw into the heart of the opposing general. In fact, up until the invention of gunpowder, most European battles were fought in exactly that way. Of course, after every soldier was packing heat, it became much harder to carry out mid-battle topery on the enemy commander. But there is something primal about the need to settle scores up close and personal. The romantic and glorious nature of combat means that even grown men who should know better want to go all Queensbury rules on each other at the first sign of trouble. I was once lured into watching the Ultimate Fighting Championship only to realise that 90% of the time it's just two men in what appears to be missionary position. I could only stomach watching about an hour before I got cramped. Anyway, welcome to part 3 of a 47 part series on how to play 2nd edition Warhammer 40,000. Today we are talking about the combat phase. The best part about this video is that unlike the movement phase and the shooting phase, which had their share of rules gotchas, the combat phase was actually a triumph of early 90s games design. Yes, it's not perfect, but if your game lasted until the sides met in combat, you were in for the thrill of the week, second only until Baywatch came on TV at night. You simply picked a combat and then each rolled the number of dice listed under your model's attacks profile, plus an extra one if you had two close combat weapons or pistols. You added the highest dice to your weapon skill to form your combat score, adding one for each one your opponent rolled and one for each six you rolled after the first. Sprinkle in a few extra modifiers, plus one if you charged, plus one if you were higher up, minus one if you are carrying a heavy weapon, minus one if you charged an enemy behind an obstacle. Then, after rolling dice, if your model was armed with a sword or another weapon that had the parry ability, you could force your opponent to re-roll one of them. After that, then the model with the highest combat score dealt the difference in values to the loser, with whatever combat weapon they wanted. Draws came down to the model's initiative characteristic, and the model with the highest value scored one hit on the loser. If those were tied, no hits were dealt. So, if your Karandras beat a goth orc in close combat by seven, that goth orc would take 7 power fist hits and be removed from the battlefield faster than you can say I don't think enough YouTubers have their own paint range. If a model killed all of its attackers at the end of a combat sequence, they could perform a follow up move of 2 inches. It may not sound like much, but watching 2 grown wargamers rolling a combat phase like this is like watching 2 rutting stags clash in the heart of a misty autumnal forest. You can picture the scene as the sunlight filters through the dense canopy, their muscles rippling beneath their sleek coats, they lock eyes and breathe steamy vapour into the crisp cool air. Suddenly they charge, the clash of antlers breaking the silence, their roars reverberating throughout the woodland as they mark their territory and assert their dominance in an awe-inspiring spectacle of nature's raw power. I mean I've never seen it happen in exactly that way, but that's how I imagine it. Now, you might have noticed that in a combat between two parties, you would have one model definitively winning the role and raining down hits on their opponent while remaining completely untouched. But powerful and skilled single combatants wouldn't always have it their own way. If they were surrounded in combat, the player who outnumbered their opponent picks the order in which models fight, and the second and subsequent models cumulatively gain an extra attack and add one to their final combat score. So if your orc mob was fully surrounding our previously mentioned Phoenix Lord, the orc player could wait until the final pairing of combatants before using the orc knob with power fist who could step forward with 5 bonus attacks and add plus 5 to his final combat score. Without butchering the use of the word, a powerful character in combat in 2nd edition works in a more realistic manner. You would charge your powerful model into combat and depending on how many models you could get into base to base contact with, you would probably kill one or two of them and then be mugged in the next round unless you brought some kind of support. When you are done, it's high fives all round and we can head home and watch Gladiator safe in the knowledge that playing Doom with the Chainsaw had nothing on this. Yes, I know this is the point where I pick holes in a venerable old rule set with the arrogance of a man who has just beaten his great granddad in a game of football in the back garden and insists he receives an award on his homemade podium, but I have to do this to maintain my highly thought of journalistic integrity. If you are playing this today with a stranger, the main bone of contention is how to interpret the ruling that states that opposing models may only fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat if their bases are touching. This has been an issue with combat 
combats for years, with sometimes even tournaments ruling that if you manage to block combat access by sticking your models in ruins or another piece of scenery that was off ground level, and preventing your opponent from physically getting their models in base to base contact, they could be entirely unaffected by the swirling mass of Hormigons a few feet below them. And to be entirely fair here to a 30 year old rule set, this was causing problems in the game many years later, and wasn't fixed until we all agreed on a 1 inch engagement range. In a similar note, you would need to work out how and when to apply the modifiers for being higher up and behind cover, because both of these would also appear to disregard the need for base to base contact. The only other rules query is what order you fought the combats in. It's assumed that the player whose turn it is picked the order of the fights each round, but not directly stated. So in certain circumstances you could micromanage combats by using a follow up move from one model to pin an enemy model in place, rather than allow them to use their follow up move to engage more units. Again, compared to your movement and shooting phases, rules wise we are pretty much golden, because in the 90s you couldn't just pull out your phone to look up the rules, so disputes at this time were settled by the blade. Gearing a squad for combat was a challenge, but a nice one for a change, as you had almost full control over exactly what everyone was carrying. Space Marine assault squads in particular looked like they were using the vast armoury of a millennia old galaxy beating fighting force that they should do, rather than how they look today, which is like someone just gave them a chainsaw each and told them to try their best. No wonder why no one ever used assault marines once Vanguard veterans were released. You'd have thought chapter masters would find that a lot more of those assault marines would reach veteran status if they could actually beat the enemies those jump packs were supposed to get them in contact with. I mean, the latest law has called churn out something like half a million Primaris marines and just dump them in space? Did he just forget to turn on the power sword factory for their assault troops? Imperial Guard get them? Sisters of Battle get them? No, as it turns out, Astartes sized power swords are just really hard to make, even in the 10,000 years he has allegedly been working on them. In fact, while we're at it, how do the newer produced Primaris legions even have veterans? They've only been around for a few years. How do they even have chaplains and librarians and critically any kind of experienced command structure at all? Uh, sorry, talking about the current law has given me indigestion. I need a small break before I can continue. While I'm seeking medical help, please view a selection of merchandise and consider spending some of your ill-gotten gains. If you were going equipped for combat in 2nd edition, you would have many options. Sometimes you would rather be a power sword than a power fist, as the ability to parry kept your model alive longer and had them winning combats more often. Of course, everyone's favourite close combat weapons were included, and they were all perfectly balanced. The Harlequin's Kiss would automatically wound, and if your opponent failed a basic armour save, the model was instantly killed, so that's goodbye to any hive tyrants or carnifexes that get in combat. Chainswords had a strength of 4, however Space Marine Heroes had a strength of 5, so they would generally be using their fists instead, and those fists would do the same damage against infantry as a single handed power axe. The thunder hammer started its reign of dominance, it automatically wounded the target, dealt d6 damage, and automatically penetrated any vehicle armour. However, because it was so large and required so much power, it could only be taken by models in terminator armour, but weirdly not dreadnoughts, who had to wander around with a single puny infantry style power fist, the same weapon the elder guardians could carry. This bizarre situation is shown in Minisodes' Dreadnought Deathmatch video, where one repeatedly beats a Carnifex in combat only to do a single damage each time. This is one of the only weaknesses with Space Marine Dreadnoughts. However, Bjorn the Fell Handed was another story. He was awesome, he had a weapon skill of 8 and got a Lightning Claw. Lightning Claws were another Terminator only weapon, and were just better power fists that did D3 damage and allowed the user to parry. So Big Bad Bjorn would thrash a Carnifex in a straight fight without the need for the rest of ABBA, and prove that one arm is better than four. Because the combat phase was such an unbridled triumph of design, if not balance, we should probably talk about its absolute master. Janzar, the storm of silence, the form of science, the swarm of guidance, the corn of compliance. Luckily, sexism didn't exist in the 90s, and neither did social media. If it had, you would have had a small group of keyboard warriors screaming that the Elder Codex contained the single female special character with the model in 2nd edition, and that she was so good in combat she hurt. She hurt everyone else that is. Most codexes and army books had special characters that were slightly weaker than normal custom built characters, to try and give examples of the kind of legendary people that inhabit the universe, without forcing players to go down the route of having to have your faction's toughest character show up to every game to keep up with your mates. However, ravishing Rick Priestley either disregarded those instructions when it came to the Phoenix Lord of the Howling Banshee Shrine, or just happened to come up with a selection of wargear and abilities that made her extremely powerful by accident. In stark contrast to the other close combat 
combat-based Phoenix Lord in the book Carandrus, who appear to have been given a random selection of abilities and powers that offered no synergy together, Jan Zar could charge a total of 18 inches, outpacing almost everything on the battlefield at that time. Once she got into combat, players would witness the golden age of the legendary Mask of Jan Zar, which meant the enemy couldn't fire Overwatch or roll any attack dice in the first round of combat. In addition, the enemy couldn't roll any attack dice in the second round of combat on a d6 roll of 4 or more. In addition to that, if the target was somehow still standing at the end of that second combat round, Jan Zar could use her 4 inch leap move to move out of combat and then in the elder player's turn, charge back in and trigger the effects of her mask again. Clocking in at 187 points, I would probably still back her to beat down anything including an avatar and bloodthirster in combat. Even if her enemies could strike back, she re-rolled armor saves, her blade of destruction allowed her to parry twice, and any ones her enemies rolled added two to her combat score instead. Despite all this, she was still vulnerable to just being completely surrounded in combat and mugged by the aforementioned champion carrying a decent close combat weapon. However, that's where an unlikely model steps in. Marnius Kalgar has never really been portrayed as a close combat monster. Even before the return of the big bad boy in blue, Kalgar was much more the strategist rather than an infantry blending machine. However, in this edition, the second best man in Cyan had some tricks up his sleeves namely the Gauntlets of Ultramar. Their special ability was that opponents do not receive any bonuses for multiple combats, and that is massive, especially as that's the only way certain armies could ever hope to bring down big characters in combat. Kalgar also clocked in and had incredibly svelte 134 points, and could pack an extra two Wargear cards if needed. But even without a field save or combat drugs, he could be trusted to blend a squad or two, especially if your opponent was unaware of his special rules. I should probably go back and rewrite that stuff about the modern day faction leader models being extremely powerful in game. Yeah, I'll do that in the edit. The Aversa Assassin would get a much reduced version of this ability called Combat Master, which for each opponent after the first added plus one to his weapon skill. Unfortunately, as weapon skill capped at 10 and he started at 8, it didn't work quite as well as just negating combat bonuses. There was also one extra dynamic in combat that you needed to be aware of. I know I spent a long time running down the Avatar of Cain, however only a few combat weapons dealt more than one wound a time. Meanwhile the Avatar's Wailing Doom, and for that matter the Bloodthirster's Axe of Corn, dealt deep three wounds a pop, and as most human scale characters topped out at three to four wounds, even a single unsaved hit could yeet them into the dead pile. So what happened? How come this rule set didn't survive into the new millennium? Well, the big problem here is that these rules, as deep and fun as they were, did not scale well. People wanted to play with bigger armies, and Games Workshop wanted people to buy bigger armies. And once gamers grew in points level, a sprawling combat could take a long while to resolve, especially if it was not a particularly important one, or the outcome was one Decided. Once you get a massive melee in mid-table, working out who goes first, who has forward and who hasn't starts to slow the game down. Especially if each player has models with the parry ability and they're trying to work out if they should risk re-rolling a dice and what effect that has on the combat. I played in a few larger games where both players just negotiated between themselves as to what the casualties were going to be in an engagement rather than rolling dice. It seems like I bring this up in every rules video, but once again Necromunda was the perfect scale for this rule set. As the player interaction of someone parrying a 5 only for their opponent to roll a natural 6 and just kill one of their dozen models absolutely makes the games more fun and immersive. It's slightly less immersive when two players decide that the Bloodthirster will kill about 3 of the 10 Terminators surrounding it before being brought down. But you can't really blame them as miniature war game sessions at this time were typically more of a cooperative event than a tense game of competitive chainsaw polo. These days combats are much more cinematic and upon the dawning of 3rd edition characters would regularly storm into combat with the squad, pick up three or four in the first round and proceed to eat up the rest until they either died or ran away. You might say that this issue breaks the game a bit, but everything in every game was broken in the 90s. Every card game, every board game and every miniatures game. It's almost as if life isn't perfect and we constantly have to pick between the least worst of every available option. Some of those least worst options are pretty good. After all, Half-Life 3 will never come out, but I'm going to try and make it through next Christmas anyway. It's time to thank my Kofi subscribers who are the greatest champions of the hobby. If you want to join them and see your name on this board, the link is in the description below. If you want to learn more about the shooting phase in 2nd edition, it's right here. Click now and I'll see you next time.